Hi A6, it's Mr. Shout here again with another reading slash science lesson. Um, this one is all about pond life. Now what is going to be slightly different about this one is at the end of this lesson there is a little investigation that you can do at home as well. So stay tuned for that. So before we begin, a couple of questions for you. First one, how many living things can you name that might live in a British pond? And have you ever seen any living things in a pond? And if so, which ones? Now, just to clarify, it doesn't just mean a goldfish pond. So it could be a pond in a park, for example, as well. So pause the video there and have a think of those for me. OK, so there's probably a lot of different things that you come up with. I'll go through some of the main ones that I think I've seen. So I've definitely seen some little fish before. I've seen frogs and tadpoles and some frog spawn. Um, seen a wide variety of different plants and also seen lots and lots of insects, things like dragonflies. Pond life. Ponds are important havens for UK wildlife but unfortunately more than one third of them have disappeared over recent years. This is due to changes in how areas of land are used. It is vitally important that we keep and look after the remaining ponds in this country as they provide homes for many freshwater amphibians and invertebrates. They also provide bathing water for birds and a well-earned drink for other wandering mammals. If you visit a local pond or are lucky enough to have a pond in your own garden, here are some of the wild and wonderful creatures that you may just be lucky enough to encounter. Frogs and toads. Frogs and toads are both freshwater amphibians and are often confused with one another but it is actually quite easy to tell them apart. Frogs have smooth green or brown skin and they lay their spawn in clumps. Toads are warty creatures with golden eyes and they leave long chains of spawn which look like strings of pearls. Frogs and toads also move differently. Frogs jump away from danger using their long stripy legs while toads crawl away when they feel threatened. If you are lucky enough to spot any spawn or tadpoles in your local or garden pond, do not move them. Leave them in their natural habitat in plenty of warm sunlight. Water boatmen and pond skaters. Two of the most common swimming invertebrates found in UK ponds are water boatmen and pond skaters. You can spot water boatmen by their large hind legs. They are shaped like a boat's oars and they use them to push themselves through the water as they swim. Just like a scuba diver, they carry their own air supply around their bodies. Pond skaters have slim brown bodies with six spindly legs. Each of their three pairs of legs do a different job. The short front legs collect dead insects from the water's surface. The middle pair move the bug forwards and the back legs act as rudders to steer them in the right direction. Both species are very fast moving so catching them in a sieve or a net is often quite a challenge. Dragonflies, damselflies and mayflies. Pond life isn't just about creatures that you might see in the water itself. As you walk near a pond you may also see some very beautiful and interesting invertebrates dancing above the water too. These tiny creatures play a huge part in pond life and are a key part of the food chain. All three of these invertebrates start life as an egg but each species lays their eggs in different places. Dragonfly eggs are laid onto plant material or loosely into the water. Damselflies inject their eggs into plant stems, mud or beneath the surface of a pond. Mayflies lay their eggs straight into the water. The eggs sink to the bottom before quickly hatching into nymphs. I've then got the glossary at the side, so we've got an amphibian, which is a cold-blooded animal that begins its life in water with gills and a tail, but grows and develops lungs and legs for adult life on land. Invertebrates is an animal that does not have a backbone, and rudders is part of a boat, a ship or an aircraft that help it to steer. Why not go for a dip? Pond dipping is a fun activity that doesn't need much equipment. Why not find out what's lurking in and around a pond near you? You'll be shocked at the number of different creatures that share a home in or by the water. All you need is a net or sieve 
a small tray, ideally a white one, and a pond dipping identification checklist. Number one, you should always go pond dipping on a flat grassy bank where the pond water is not out of your depth. Slowly and carefully approach the edge of the water, never run. It is often safer to lie flat on your tummy facing the water's edge. Number two, get an adult to fill your tray with pond water. Number three, carefully lower your net or sieve into the pond. Move it slowly through the water with a sweeping action. Number four, gently lift it out and turn your catch out into your tray. Use the checklist to find out what you have caught. Look but never touch. Number five. When you have finished, get an adult to slowly pour the creatures from the tray back into the pond. It is very important to keep yourself safe near water. You should always go pond dipping with an adult to look after you. You may even be able to go to an organised event at a local nature reserve. Right, so let's get into the questions then. Which of these creatures is described as a freshwater amphibian with smooth skin? A frog, a toad, a water boatman, or a pond skater? Number two, join the boxes to match the facts to the pond creature it relates to. So can you please write the sentences next to the creature instead of doing the boxes and drawing lines, please? So we've got a water boatman, a pond skater, and a mayfly. And then the sentences are, they quickly hatch into nymphs, they have large or shaped hind legs, and they have three pairs of legs. And then number three, here are some of the wild and wonderful creatures that you may just be lucky enough to encounter. Write a word or a phrase which could be used instead of encounter in this sentence. Question four. What fraction of UK ponds have disappeared over recent years? Question 5. Find and copy a phrase from the text which describes how the net or sieve should be moved through the water. Question 6. And a well-earned drink for other wandering mammals. What does this phrase imply about the wandering mammals? Number 7. Get an adult to fill your tray with pond water. Explain why this instruction specifically involves an adult. Think about your past experiences for that one. It might help you. Question 8. They leave long chains of spawn which look like strings of pearls. Why do you think the author describes the toad's spawn in this way? Number 9. A small tray, ideally a white one. Explain why the author suggests that the tray should ideally be white. Okay, pause the video here, have a go at all of those questions for me, and then we'll get onto the experiment once we're done. Right, starting off with question one then. So which of the creatures is described as a freshwater amphibian with smooth skin? The answer is a frog. Okay, join the boxes to match the facts of the pond creature it relates to. So the water boatman has the oar-shaped hind legs. The pond skater has three pairs of legs. It has six in total. And then the mayfly quickly hatch into nymphs. OK, uh, number three. Here are some of the wild and wonderful creatures that you may just be lucky enough to encounter. Write a word or a phrase which could be used instead of encounter. So if you not, aren't sure what encounter meant, you could have looked it up. Um, but you can kind of work it out from what it says in the sentence, really. It says uh, you might just be lucky enough to encounter one of these creatures. So could be a few things. You could say find. So creature that you were lucky enough to find. You could say uh, see, quite straightforward. Um, you could say discover. Um, you could say meet. OK, 
Okay, in terms of a phrase, you might say something like come across, but yeah, just any one of those will be fine. Okay, question four, what fraction of UK ponds have disappeared over recent years? Uh, it says in the text that more than one third It says find and copy a phrase from the text which describes how the net or sieve should be moved through the water. Now this was right on the last slide about the um, about the pond dipping, um, and it says that you need to do it with a sweeping action. Okay, that's your phrase. Um, and then the last one it says uh, a well-earned drink for other wandering mammals. What does this phrase imply about the wandering mammals? So if it's a well-earned drink, they've earned their drink. So it, uh, it, it suggests that the mammals, or wandering mammals, have like, worked hard for their drink. Could be because they've travelled a long distance or something like that. Or they've got their hard-earned drink. Okay, question seven: Get an adult to fill your tray with pond water. Explain why this instruction specifically involves an adult. Now you're probably quite used to this. You're probably used to seeing things where it says, "Oh, get an adult to help you," and it's no different to any of those other things. What this is on about here, and it's all to do with safety. So, um, I would say. This instruction involves an adult um, in order to Keep children safe. Okay, it's just suggesting, particularly if it's younger children, um, that leaning over into a pond filling your tray with more water might be dangerous by the water. Okay, number eight, they leave long chains of spawn which look like strings of pearls. Why do you think the author describes the toad's spawn in this way? So, if any author kind of compares one thing to another, they're usually doing it to try and paint a clearer picture in your mind, to try and help you understand what this thing might look like. Okay, so... Uh, the author describes the toad's spawn this way. So that the reader get 
gets an idea of what looks like and obviously if you pick something like a more everyday object it makes it easier for people to understand the more common that object is the more well known it is to be honest a, a string of pearls isn't really the best idea but um, obviously some people will know what those look like okay number nine it says a small tray ideally a white one so why has the author suggested that the tray should be white? Now you've got to think what you are using this tray for. So you're getting water out of a pond and trying to see creatures in it. So if you imagine that you're using like a dark coloured tray, it could be quite difficult to see things. Whereas if it's white, anything against a white background really stands out. So that's going to be your reason. So, the tray should be white, so that any creatures stand out. Okay, so now you're going to have a go at doing a experiment that relates specifically to the pond skater and the water boatman. Now you're going to need to find a small bowl and fill it with water. You're going to need two paper clips and then an optional extra. You don't necessarily need this, but you can do another investigation if you get either washing up liquid or some hand soap. So if you go and get all those things first and then come back when you have. Right, so I'm going to set you a challenge now. Now you can only use your paper clips and the bowl of water that you have. And I want you to see if you can make your paper clip float. Okay, make it so that it floats. You don't need the soap or the washing up liquid at this point. In fact, it will make it worse. So don't even bother trying. Just use your paper clips and your bowl of water and can you get one of them to float? Okay, have a go at that. Pause the video. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how you do it. You might have already figured this out for yourself. I've got my two paper clips. What you need to do with one of them is you need to open it up like that. It makes like a bit of an L shape. And then this acts as a little balancing beam for the other paper clip. And then all you need to do is you lower paper clip very very gently into the water and pull the other one away and you're left with the floating paper clip. Now just to show you that it isn't a trick or anything I will just drop it in and it does sink to the bottom if I do it any other way. Another thing that you can do I told you about um, if you have some soap or washing up liquid if you actually put a little drop of soap or washing up liquid into the water eventually once it's had a chance to spread around the water it should sink there you go just like that pretty cool all right so how does this thing work now it's to do with something called surface tension and basically what it means is that there's sort of a skin on the surface of the water where the water molecules hold on tightly to each other so if the conditions are right they can hold tight enough to support the weight of really small objects like your paper clip the paper clip is not actually floating because paper clips don't float that's why when you tried to put it in the first time round more likely than not it would have sank straight away to the bottom it's actually just being held up by this surface tension by this like invisible skin on top of the water now many insects such as water boatmen and pond skaters they use this sort of skin to walk and skip across the top of a pond and obviously if we tried it we're way too heavy and we just sink so that's what that's what causes it it's called surface tension 
Now I've obviously showed you another thing um, to do with the washing up liquid as well. And what the washing up liquid does is it disrupts this surface tension on the top of the water and it breaks it apart which means that it can no longer hold the weight of the paper clip. And the funny thing is if you keep trying after you've put washing up liquid in it just won't work. No matter how hard you try you won't be able to get that paper clip to float again unless you get some fresh water. Now there's other investigations that you can do because that kind of little video I've just showed you it's just a demonstration it's not really an investigation yet or an experiment. So there's a few things that you could try. Um, the first one is you could try how many paper clips can the surface tension hold. So lower as many paper clips as you can into the water and see how many you can get to hold onto the top of the water. You could do just the shape of the paper clip affect its floating ability. So if you change the the paper clip, if you bent it in any way, can you still get it to float? Um, the third one is what liquids have the strongest surface tension. So if you this one might be quite difficult, but if you do have other liquids available in the house, you might be able to do that. But just obviously be careful and check with an adult if you're okay to use those liquids. And the fourth one is can the surface tension of water be made stronger? So if you have any of this at home, try sprinkling some baby powder onto the surface and then see if you can hold more paper clips with a bit of baby powder on the top of the water. See how you get on with those. Um, obviously you don't need to do this, it's just a bit of fun really to see uh, what you can come up with. Well done Year 6, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope in particular you enjoyed doing the little experiment. It's a really cool little trick and it's, it's a great one to do for friends when we can see people again. You can, If you've got a paperclip and some water lying around you can challenge them to make a paperclip float and most of the time people fail so it's always a good trick to show people and do a bit of showing off. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Look forward to sharing the next lesson with you soon.